thank you all for being here. This is a uh, panel discussion of a somewhat unusual format uh, about what a theory of consciousness is for. Uh, what good is it? Uh, there's been a, a, a vast uh, re um, emergence of the idea of a science of consciousness since about 2000, uh, somewhere in there. So now we've had about two decades of, of this new energy and the idea of having a science of consciousness. And I think it's good to ask the question, uh, why are we doing that? What is, what, is, what is the intention behind trying to develop a, a science of consciousness? So that's, that's what I've asked the panelists here uh, to address. Uh, the panelists are uh, Rob Nail from Singularity University, uh, Stuart Hameroff from Arizona, uh, Paul Bush from your center in Portugal, <laughs> uh, Ricardo Manzati uh, from Turin? Milan. 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 And I'm Chris Fields. Uh, I am not institutional, but live in southern France. And I'm going to ask the panelists two questions <clears throat> and give each of them uh, three minutes to address each question. And that will hopefully leave us with enough time at the end to have 15 or 20 minutes of interaction uh, with the audience, so our task is to provoke you to ask us questions, ask each other questions, uh, ask yourself questions. So the, the first question to the panel is, um, were we to have a, a true or, or a scientifically well-supported theory of consciousness, um, what is the main misconception, common misconception, that that theory of consciousness would dispel or would lead us to abandon? So I want to start uh, with that question with Stuart. Stuart, <laughs> what is, what's the main misconception that a theory of consciousness will allow us to get rid of? Well, I guess it depends which theory turns out to be correct. Uh, the one I hope is correct, the one I favor, advocate, would dispel the misconception that it would ruin everything for people who believe that consciousness is something special, non-local, uh, can exist outside of the brain and body, uh, of parapsychology, even uh, out-of-body, uh, near-death, afterlife experiences, um, and that even idealism, um, these things could be at least partially true if a quantum theory of consciousness turns out to be correct, particularly the Penrose idea that consciousness uh, is involved somehow with the uh, interface between quantum physics and relativity. That is to say that consciousness is a process in the structure of the universe, the very fine scale structure of the universe, even down to the Planck scale, which is non-local. And of course, that would open up another mystery, non-locality and, and, uh, and how that occurs, but if that approach turns out to be correct, then it would, I think, satisfy what a lot of people in Eastern philosophical approaches or mystical approaches, even religious approaches, uh, look for in a theory of consciousness in terms of non-locality and uh, cosmic uh, implications and that sort of thing, if that theory turns out to be correct. If it turns out the brain is a computer, then forget it. Forget all that other stuff. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, Ricardo, what would you say to that question? Well, I think that uh, like um, a, a, a philosopher like Whitehead once said, um, we are not able to understand what is uh, consciousness in, in a scientific world because we are moving from a wrong assumption. And I think that there's a big, there's an elephant in the room. There's a big assumption that we all take for granted. Namely, that consciousness has to be some, somehow inside our body, or generated by something that takes place inside our body. This is a very big assumption, but it might prove to be wrong. And it might be the case that uh, the uh, theory of consciousness that will uh, succeed to explain what we are, what is our consciousness in the world, 
may prove that the assumption was wrong. So science has not been able to find consciousness in the brain because science has been looking in the wrong place. But this doesn't necessarily imply that we have to step into a, a dualist uh, view. That doesn't imply that consciousness has to be, uh, let's say, made of a different stuff than the physical world. It may simply mean that consciousness is physical, but it's not where we've been looking for it. So consciousness may be a property, or may be identical, not with the body, but may be identical with the world. And this is incredibly important, not only for science, but also for society and for ourselves, because it would allow ourselves to get free from the cage of the body, from the platonic idea, which is very popular in the brain and computer world, that the world we see is only a shadow of the real world, is a mental computational representation of the external world. What if that was not the case? What if we could give up our uh, belief to be our bodies? We are not somebody, nobody or anybody. We may be a world that our bodies brings into existence. Nice. Uh, Rob, what would you say? So uh, first, I would just say uh, I'm uh, grateful for being here. I'm surprised I'm here. I'm pretty much a simple-minded engineer. And so to be here with some pretty big thinkers is uh, interesting. Uh, but I also run Singularity University, where I get surrounded with oh, a lot right. of people like this all the time. And it tests my limits. So I pick up a few things here and there. But as an engineer, you'll see it's pretty obvious how I'm framing the, the problem. Um, with, with regard to consciousness, I really do think that the, the one problem that, that uh, will open up innovation and opportunity is around thinking of it as that single, singular thing. So if there is actually a spectrum of consciousness that pervades lots of other aspects of our lives and our environment, that opens up different kind of exploration that, that allows new, new kinds of uh, thinking and correlations. So as an engineer, um, I'll, I'll just sort of th throw out how, how I, I see the spectrums building. Um, the, actually, one, one frame we use at Singularity is that we always say that the experts are the people that can tell you how something can't possibly be done or happen. Right? It's interesting. They're usually the ones that are absolutely determined that will never, ever happen. Until it does, of course, right? So, so it's just an interesting mindset shift. Um, as an engineer, the, the thing that I learned about that, that is fascinating is that um, there's a little sea creature called a sea squirt. Does everyone know the story of a sea, sea squirt? Mm -hmm. So it's a little... Uh, tadpole-like fish that swims around getting food, and as it grows up and gets to adolescent stage, it goes and it finds a nice little rock and it plants itself there, and the first thing it does is it, effects, it effectively eats its brain because it really doesn't need it any longer. Uh, the complex, and there's actually some research that maybe is contrary to this, but the concept is our brains have evolved largely to navigate the physical world. Doing computation and, and programming is pretty easy if you're playing chess and doing things. If you want to navigate this crazy space, it gets really, really hard at an exponential rate really fast. So, so my personal uh, uh, model, with autonomous cars, we're seeing navigating spaces in radical ways. Uh, at some point here, we're going to equip them with blockchain agency to earn money on their own. With, back to Jack's thing a moment ago, now it has intention and purpose along with its autonomy, which is going to look a lot like our con consciousness concepts, but it's at different levels. And so, so it's kind of a fun time of exploration that we have to allow to, to explore, um, I think, at more depth. Right, Paul? Okay. Um, to me, the thing that is missing from a real theory of consciousness is, other people have said this, that the brain is not generating consciousness. And this is an assumption for sure in my field. In neuroscience, they're convinced about it, except for the ones who believe that consciousness is an illusion. Um, to try and explain this, I think that there's something, a distinction that Nizar Gadata made is helpful here. He says there are two aspects to consciousness. So he notes first that consciousness is always consciousness of something. There's always a subject when, when you're talking about consciousness. And consciousness of objects and the 
the, uh, the representation of objects in the brain and the dynamics of those representations have been pretty well established in neuroscience. You can record from very specific areas in the cortex and you can find exactly when a very small number of neurons activates corresponding to the subject's perception of some item in the external world. So, you, you, And you can even manipulate it. So you can do an experiment with monkeys where you find exactly the cells that will respond when they see something going left. And right next to them, there's the cells that respond when they see something going right. And then you show them something going right, you stimulate the cells that are, going, that are, that are responsive to the left going motion, and the monkey reports it sees something going left. So we have some very good, what's called in um, neuroscience, very good correlates of consciousness. And there are uh, several very useful neuroscientific models, such as the global workspace model, um, Tonini's model, which are all useful neuroscience because they give us a handle on what parts of the brain are involved in doing different parts of um, cognition and establishing neuroscience, a neuroscientific view of consciousness. But what they all miss um, is what Nizagara to terms as awareness. And that is, how is it, how does that translate, all these dynamics translate into our felt subjective experience of all of these contents that are moving around in the brain? Why, why are these contents, for us, something living that we see and feel, we can see a color, and there is not a single neuroscience theory of how this awareness occurs. There's nobody has any idea in terms of neuroscience terms. And it's, for me, it's clear that it's because there is no, you cannot make a jump between um, materialistic theories to some theory of subjective experience. Because for me, awareness itself is actually the ontological basis of what we term, term as physical material reality. That's it for me. Great. Um, so before we leave this question, I, I wanted to give you my answer as well, <laughs> since I got to make up the questions. Um, I actually think that when we have a correct theory of consciousness, it will convince us that there is no observer-independent ontology of any kind. And that the best we can do ontologically is, is ontologies in practice for particular observers. And that's a, a radical statement. Uh, it, it reflects a, 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 an idea about consciousness that I think Paul articulated, uh, but one that sees the existence of objects uh, always as, as constructions. And I think a, a real theory of consciousness will tell us how we're constructing uh, not just objects, but space-time and everything else that we think of as, as part of ontology, part of what's out there in the world. So um, let's move on to the next can, question. Can I respond to something Paul said? Or uh, am sure, I if, if it's quick. So the, those neurons that tell the monkey, or that correlate with a monkey feeling that things moving left, or any neural correlate of consciousness, you're talking about the activity at the membrane level. But what takes away awareness, anesthesia, actually works at the quantum level. And evidence now shows that anesthesia works at the quantum level in microtubules at a deeper level inside neurons, not the membrane. So when you measure, or anyone measures, Membrane activity, uh, action potentials, dendritic potentials, EEG, local field potentials, uh, that's really a derivative of what's going on at the deeper quantum level, which seems to correlate with consciousness, namely quantum activities in the, in the microtubules. And that's, you'll, you'll talk much more about that. This okay, evening. I don't believe I, anesthesia takes away awareness. I think it takes away memory, but that's mine. Oh, well, so you think everybody's awake and suffering under anesthesia? Well, awareness is identified with uh, different and it is at one time when, under awareness, that the person ceases to exist, but awareness, awareness continues, is my belief, my experience. Okay. So Your let's... experience? Okay, I'll shut up. Let's, let's move on to the next question. 
So the next question, I think, is a, a harder question, a more interesting question, and um, in a way, a more, a more relevant question, which is, when we have a correct, well-validated theory of consciousness, if we can achieve a correct, well-validated theory of consciousness, how will that help society as a whole? How will that help make things better? And so I would, I would like the panelists to also consider that question. And this time, let's go in a different order. So uh, Paul, why don't you take a, a okay. stab at that question first? All right. Um, I think that if we actually did have a global consensus of uh, what consciousness is, understanding what consciousness is, and it was the correct theory, which is the kind of the presupposition of the question, then pretty much all the problems will be solved. That will be the end of problems. Because all of the problems that we have as, as people is believing that we are people. And what that means is that we believe that we are a body and a mind, and this is me, and that the boundary of my body outside is not me. And that stops, that's something else, and it's not really, I'm not even sure if it's alive or conscious in the, in the current materialist ideas. And this is the source of all the problems, because as soon as you believe that you are a, a, a limited thing, a limited body, you're making an artificial separation. You're believing that things really, really are separate, and you're defining a perspective. You're defining, saying, me is here, it has a definite locality, a position, and outside is not me, and I'm constrained being a body and a mind. I'm constrained to defend myself against all these other random things that aren't me, and I have to get things that I need to perpetuate my body. And so it kind of, it locks us into the, the position that we're actually in now, and that position is being, being uh, ruled by politicians who decide that what we need to do is put some person or group or country first, and that is the most important thing to do, and everyone else has to be discarded in the race for, for supremacy, because that's the most important thing, that's what's gonna keep us alive. Even on a personal point of view, if you really abandon religion, which has happened because of the rise of science, and um, you believe in materialism, what do you have to go for? Basically what you have to go for is not some kind of uh, global thing, it's get as much pleasure as I can get. You take what you can get for now and screw everyone else. And for me, morality, that's the reason why there is no, no morality in the world. I don't believe in politics because politicians are people. Politicians always are gonna have the same failings every time. Every, every idealistic society, the communists, great idea, but when it comes to real people running the show, it doesn't work because the people believe that they're separate. They believe they're separate and they need to look out for themselves and look out for their group. And once we understand that awareness is universal and universal awareness is our identity, all of us, that's our identity, then there's no question of morality. Doing something for someone else is the same as doing something for yourself. And that's gonna be the solution for, um, that we're gonna get from really understanding consciousness. Okay. Well said. Oh. <laughs> uh, Rob, would you like to go next? I don't think there's anything left. It basically solves all problems. So I think, <laughs> thank you, Paul. Um, I, so I, I totally agree. I, the, the thing, maybe just very specific, before it solves all problems, it, it gets us, it moves us quite a ways there. I, I do like the idea of granting a, a consciousness as this thing that connects us in a new way. Um, and, and I just think about animals and animal rights as a really small practical thing, right? If we, if we grant there's some level of consciousness there, the way that we interact with food changes dramatically, right? And that, just practically speaking, has a radical impact on society as a whole globally almost overnight. And, and, and we've seen one of the things that uh, I'm fascinated by right now is, is uh, the, the rise of our shift around eating meat. Um, we, 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 perceived that there was gonna be a long, delayed approach to that, and now we have these companies going public that are working on in vitro meat. And I don't think it's 
disconnected from the realities of, of our maybe innate belief that there is consciousness there, we're just sort of ignoring it. And, and, and that, that, that's an exciting sort of shift that I think a new model can allow us to uh, accept and, and maybe start to shift our day-to-day -day actions that are, that are more connected and resonant to our, our maybe deeper ethics and beliefs. So again, I think I agree with Paul. It's gonna solve all problems, so we're good. Uh, Ricardo? Well, <clears throat> I think that um, there isn't any more important question than what is consciousness. Uh, not only a, a scientific, from a scientific perspective, but from a personal perspective. If we don't have the right answer to that question, our life basically is a lie. Because we live all our life thinking of being something different from what we are. Because after all, consciousness is a, a word to refer to what we are, what am I. So, what am I? I am a soul. I am a neural a program running inside my brain. I am something else, like I claim. I am the world. I am a physical emergent property. What am I? So, depending on what I am, everything I do has a different value, has a different importance. And in the past, we saw that whenever people changed their idea about what they were, that they didn't use the word conscience, they used the word self, they used the word identity, they used the word person, all society had to change because everyone had to deal with different people, with different kinds of individuals. That happened in the Romans, that happened afterward. Think, I'm a, I like very much the example of animals. I mean, Cartesian philosophy justified vivisection because of the answer to the question, what is consciousness? And because that answer didn't uh, um, associate consciousness with animals, it was justified to cut open uh, living animals. And so forth. So, the question about consciousness is the key question, because basically it's the question that we have uh, to get it right in order to have the right life. Otherwise, we're going to have a life that is based on something that might be wrong, something that we may take to be uh, a, a right notion of consciousness, but it might just be wrong. So, from a personal perspective, I think it is the key question. What am I? What are we? Sir? I think a proper theory of consciousness, which as I said, I believe to be, involve quantum processes and microtubules connected uh, via general relativity to the structure of the universe, uh, focusing on the microtubule will, will facilitate a lot of medical breakthroughs. For example, Alzheimer's disease uh, involves uh, a breakdown of microtubules and loss of tau proteins. So rather than focusing on the amyloid plaques, we resonate the microtubules, uh, get them to grow back, and we'll treat Alzheimer's. There's uh, results, preliminary results on that already. Similarly, brain trauma, other mental disorders, uh, what's going on with the microtubules and schizophrenia, depression, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that will refocus uh, medical uh, uh, attention where it should be at a deeper level where consciousness arises rather than a secondary effect at the level of neurons. I'm confused by Paul's uh, uh, position. I don't mean to pick on you. I just met you. But uh, it, it doesn't seem, you seem to be espousing like a Buddhist uh, approach of awareness out there throughout the universe. Great. I agree. Pardon me? I don't believe in out there, but yeah. Okay. So you don't believe in out there. All right. Well, now I'm really confused. But uh, I think there is an out. So if you want to give up on reality, uh, I wouldn't do, I mean, this goes back to Einstein and Bohr, whether there's a reality out there and, and do we care what it really is. But I think there is, and I think that we are part of it. We are connected to it through quantum, quantum physics, uh, and we need a quantum mechanism in the brain to, uh, to establish that link. Uh, and that's, that's what our uh, theory of R Roger Penrose, my theory, accomplishes. So uh, I think it will uh, account for a lot of medical breakthroughs plus a philosophical breakthrough in 
showing that we can exist as kind of a wave in a sea of consciousness as you, I thought you were uh, implying earlier. Okay, so, so once again, I'll, I will offer a, a quick answer myself and then we will open this up to a more general discussion. Um, I, I think that if we have a, a real theory of consciousness, it will undermine uh, the, the idea that's been the foundation of, of all human cultures historically which is the idea that humans are special and the, the ordinary laws of the universe don't apply to us and that there are powers outside the universe or in the universe or somewhere that are very interested particularly in us and will look after us in various ways or, or punish us if we screw up, but that we are special. And I believe that a true theory of consciousness, if, if we can arrive at one, will finally convince us that we aren't special, that there's nothing special about us at all besides a, a particular set of, of capabilities that overlap with the capabilities of lots of other sorts of systems. So that's my answer to that question. So. Um, let me ask now for questions from you all. We've got sort of interesting people up here to hurl questions at for the next 20 minutes or however long we've got. Thank you all. It's a fascinating discussion and I appreciate the diversity of perspectives. So I'm just wondering, here we are, 21st century, and um, many of us thought that we would have solved an innumerable amount of problems, and here we are handing them on to the next generation. Um, I still have the same question I started with when I was much younger, and we had 64 times overkill in the thing called the Cold War. Humanity seems pretty weird to me. And um, with all our theories of consciousness and all our understandings in quantum mechanics and all our understanding of social theories, we still have this organism which is prone to annihilate both its habitation and itself and each other. And I'm just wondering how might we, with our theories of consciousness, besides just the obvious, I mean, how are we changing? What's wrong with the, if I may, or not wrong or whatever, what's the problem with the human? We have the largest amount of expenditure that we have is military, still for how we can destroy each other. And the sale of women and children and human beings is the second most uh, lucrative uh, expenditure on the planet. And then pharmaceuticals with massive addictions that we're perpetuating. So I'm just wondering, um, with the human organism, with the human species, with all that we know in our consciousness theories and our social theories, how can we create an organism that is in integrity with life and with its environment and each other? That's an excellent question. I, I'll, I'll summarize it as humans are really screwed up. What do we do about it? There's a lot of diversity there. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have a good answer to that question? Well, um, that was kind of what I was trying to say with my re response before, that the basic problem is humans believing that they are individual humans. That is kind of, for me, that's a mistake. That is a problem. That is the problem. Because that is what creates separation, and that's what creates need and uh, violence, the problems. So I think that, that realizing our common identity and the, our, the, our, our common identity, not just with each other, but with like the basic ground of what produces everything, is that for me is going to be the, the only solution that I can see to those, those kind of problems, which are continuous throughout history, as far as we can tell. Well, no, uh, very quickly. Um, 
sometimes people uh, do bad things because they're unhappy. And sometimes they're unhappy because they uh, are moving from a bad uh, uh, assumption, because they're, living, they're not living their right life. So if uh, the life that I have corresponds to what I'm really, to, 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 what, to my nature, usually I have a much more balanced relation with the world, with other people. But if the life that I carry on is systematically a life that is not my own, then I keep fighting, I keep bumping against each other, I keep screwing up things, because basically I move from a condition of unhappiness. And uh, think about, I mean, the idea that we are our body. So I spend all my day at the gym. I spend eight hours a day at the gym. I, my body, I, I spend all my money to, to, to get as fit as possible. But then at the end of the day, I'm not happy. And because I'm not happy, I need to find somehow my happiness, possibly in ways that are not good for the environment, for the world, for the society. So this, it, is, it might be that this uh, attitude of human being, this tendency of human being screwing up, comes from their deep unhappiness. And this deep unhappiness may come from the fact that they don't know what they are. I didn't really go into my personal theory on how we evolve the consciousness, but, but I do think we've biologically evolved uh, to survive through a very complex uh, brain structure that allows us this, this observer status to navigate complexity. And, and so I think we're trying to survive, and that has rooted deeply this concept of tribalism and, and other very human-like traits. And so to move beyond that, um, I'm gonna just sort of represent this whole singularity side, not that I fully believe it, but I think the technological realm that is in our lives today is not going to go away and it is not gonna slow down. And we can transcend those biological urges and impulses, right? So we don't, we don't have to have kids. The deepest, strongest uh, sense biologically to survive would be about procreating. And we have built society where we, we can kind of transcend that concept. Um, I do think that we are at a point where we're gonna have to transcend that tribalism-like concept very soon because we're at the, a new brink. You mentioned the Cold War as well. I, I think we're at that place again with new capabilities. Um, and we, we have a choice. We, we either need to shift towards a different horizon space where we wanna live far, far into the future, thousand years from now, um, and that is gonna be one that has to integrate technology at a deeper level to help uh, alleviate a lot of the stresses that we, we uh, undergo in society today around food and shelter and health. Technology can help us solve many of those basic level problems if we choose to allow it to take us there. Um, and, and I think that will eventually allow us to evolve and transcend these deep biological urges. Some of you may have already transcended spiritually. Some of us are transcending biochemically. Others are gonna do it technologically. I think that's, that's fine, but I, I do think it's this sort of natural evolution of our, our species in some way. Stuart, did you want to say yeah, something let me, in response uh, to that question? I agree with a lot of what Rob said in that the basic problem is Malthusian uh, overpopulation. There's too many people, not enough resources, global warming, et cetera, et cetera. And, and maybe the answer has something to do with consciousness, if we could all be happy, which is uh, what Ricardo was saying. But I want to take issue with one thing Rob said, that, that we evolved to navigate complex spaces. I think we evolved to feel good. And I think feelings drive evolution. I know this is, this is definitely against the grain of, of evolutionary theory, uh, or at least interpretations which uh, say that we're uh, promoting gene survival. But genes don't feel, as far as we know. Why would they give a shit whether they survive? But organisms feel. All behavior in, in lab animals, in us, in every organism, um, is, is to feel good or avoid uh, displeasure. And I think that's what drives evolution. Now, that could be hedonism. It could be altruism. If we redirect it more towards altruism and less towards hedonism, then maybe we got a chance of surviving. Questions? Uh, yes. I, um, the, the question is, what is the theory of consciousness for? And so I just wonder if I could propose something um, in, 
spirituality often spirituality puts forward a story, let's say, a, a model that helps us to come in contact with the consciousness that's present in each of us. And it's a sort of it's an ontological shift that allows us to drop out of a thinking mind that's seeking and, and inherently feels uncomfortable. And then we get to rest in our consciousness and our beingness, um, which is, I, I'm quite happy for it to be a, a biological, um, to be described as a biological function. Experientially, it's very different to being caught in thinking. And when we rest there and we know we are conscious, with consciousness aware of itself, um, if we're really honest and be there, we say, well, it doesn't tell me where it comes from. Um, and so my supposition is, do we actually need a comprehensive theory of consciousness? Or is it enough for us to have stories that turn us inwards so that we become aware of consciousness? We rest there and, and that then we find suffering can end. And spirituality is really about the end of suffering, meaning a happiness for the human being. And that happiness then I am putting forward means a different identity, a bit different uh, need from life, um, i.e. we find we are content for a causeless reason, which then means we don't need more, 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 we don't need to compete, and uh, etc., um, which seem to be the causes in life at the moment, um, overconsumption, etc., etc. So w the core of all of what I'm saying is, do we actually need to have an intellectual theory, like a theory of gravity, or is the fact that gravity exists independent of the theory, consciousness exists in the independent of the theory, and there can be a, let's say, a neurological shift that allows us to rest there, is that potentially enough to both change our personal experience and as a byproduct then solve many of the problems automatically as is being suggested by some people up there? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think that gets, um very much to the heart of what we're talking about here. Uh, if, you, if you look at typical theories in science, uh, uh, the theory of, of gravity and the rest of classical physics, uh, electronics and the rest of quantum physics, then they're good for something. We can use them to do things. So, in a sense, what we're, what we're trying to discuss here is, uh, is a theory of consciousness going to allow us to do something? And so, uh, my assumption is, would it allow us to do something beyond what we can do with technologies, if you will, uh, practices, uh, stories, <laughs> uh, that we already have? Right? We didn't need quantum theory to build fires and houses. Uh, it's really handy for building cell phones. Uh, so, yes, traditional practices give us something. We can do something with them. The question is, will having a theory of consciousness let us do something else? And, and, I, and I think that's... So that... Uh, you mentioned, Stuart, uh, medical things that are, that are in addition to what can be done with uh, uh, sort of traditional practices. Would you like to expand on that? Well, a lot of medicine is almost, maybe all, is how you feel. And, uh, you know, I see patients, I'm an anesthesiologist, I see patients who have horrible diseases but are not suffering. And I see people have trivial stuff and they're like in the worst agony ever and I'm sure we all know people like that and I you know I, I take care of all my patients as best I can regardless I don't you know judge that they're you know uh, this or that so but it's all about it's all about feelings and and so I don't you know for medicine and not just psychiatry but medicine in general it's about you know uh, feeling good. It's making the patient feel good, allowing the patient to feel good, allowing your friends, your your loved ones, your colleagues, to feel good. And uh, what does that mean? We don't know. I mean, is it a neural activity? It is, but what neural activity? Is it neuronal membrane firing? No, I don't think so. I think it's at a deeper level. Uh, Paul said, uh, you know, we don't have a clue about awareness. I disagree. We have, we know how we're starting to know how anesthesia works, and that's as close as we can get to awareness. It does it 
cross the boundary and explain a qualia? No, but it's in the right direction. So I think anesthesia is, is, uh, is, is the best approach. And also uh, drugs, other drugs that affect uh, mental states, psych psychedelics. How do psychedelics work? They're being implemented now in medical therapy. Uh, we, I've used ketamine in anesthesia for 40 years uh, in, in specific situations. And if we can understand how they act in the brain to expand consciousness, or whatever you want to call the psychedelic state, that will get us closer to the, uh, to the origin of consciousness, and then we can treat it, we can, we can optimize it, we can modify it in a way to take away pain and to enhance people's lives. So we got to understand consciousness to, to be good physicians, in my case, or good therapists, or good people in general. Anyone else like to say something to what does... There's an interesting uh, concept around narrative and story of, that we've been trying to explore. Because we, we're living in a time now where the story is much more powerful than the science or the fact, right? It's, it's how, how it makes us feel. It's, it's what it encourages us to do. Um, climate change is the perfect example where there's nice, very well-rounded theories that show us exactly what's happening. Um, but they're not accessible in a way that actually promotes action, that we take it urgently and do something about it. Similarly, once we have a theory of consciousness, does it change our behaviors and actions around it? It at least creates a, a credible enough story of what's there, but then we need other stories that will uh, promote the action to, to actually do things differently. Um, I, I do think of, of theories that they're just the most credible story you have about some subject, ultimately, right? Um, but I think that we're in a really interesting place where we gravitate, especially with social media. It's the fun, shiny, scary stories that attract us more than anything else. So we have, that's a great power that I almost, I almost think is also somewhat biological. It's, it's, we're incentivized by stories. It, it sparks our feelings, and somehow that drives us towards our survival. So we, we cannot take this storytelling concept uh, seriously enough. And, and through technology, our ability to tell stories and manipulate minds at a deeper and deeper level is a very, very real and present threat. And so we have to be very careful about this, this storytelling concept as well from that standpoint. You mean fake news? <laughs> yeah, the fake news. Imagine a virtual environment that you, I can drop you into that I can manipulate real time based on your emotional state, right? So, so we, can, we can shift the, the physical environment around you. We already have virtual reality capability that it's at this resolution. You could not tell the difference between this reality and that reality. It's not seamless and adaptive yet, but it's at that resolution. And so then if I can read your brain, know your, your emotional and, and cognitive connections to it, and adapt it quickly. Wait, wait, wait. How are you going to do that? Software. No? So this is where experts will tell you it's not possible. And six years ago, the experts in the robotics field and the auto field said, driving cars autonomously is impossible. It's never going to happen. At best, maybe 30 years from now, we'll see something. It, I mean, and I, this is an interesting reality. And, and whether it happens or not, I don't, I don't I've really but, been called yeah. an expert, so touche, but you got me on that point. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but this is an interesting space where just watching it move forward, if you just connect the dots a little further, the, the whole simulation hypothesis concept is a really in, intriguing one from that standpoint. Um, so, yeah. I'd just like to make a, a comment to the question. I believe that everything that, um, everything that we, in our phenomenological reality, that we take as external reality and we take as real and independent of us, I believe all of it is a story. All of it is a story. When science first started, now people believe science tells us how it is. Science tells us like, it's like this, that's how it is. When science first started, science was created to do things. Science was about making things happen. And that's why science gained power, because science was able to make things happen. They developed theories, and largely mathematical theories, but the theories themselves, the mathematical theories, have no interpretation. The interpretation comes when it's combined with philosophy. And the philosophy comes in and says, it must be like this. And the predictions and the things that philosophy says have to accord with people's experience of life. 
And so the, the degree to which there is agree with people's experience and the degree to which people agree with each other is as much as any, any fact is objectively true, as far as I'm concerned. And if you look at how theories change, Newtonian physics to, to uh, quantum physics was a very big change, and we haven't yet been able to produce some kind of new story which, ex which is kind of consistent with quantum, explains how does it, what does it mean? What is reality according to quantum physics now? Physicists don't agree. The mathematics doesn't tell you what reality is. It just gives you a bunch of possibilities of what that it needs to be consistent with. And, and quantum physics isn't the end point. The next point, when we have a theory that incorporates what we are, what consciousness is, what relativity, all the, all the, all the things that are right now are kind of loose ends, it's likely that this is gonna be an even bigger transformation of our current understanding of how things are. And again, it'll be another story because in the end, you can't write down what reality is. You can only, you can only be it. Well, I have a, quick, a very quick follow-up on that. Um, first, I must say that I don't agree that science has been created to do things. Because if you look at the intention of Galileo, Newton, or Francis Bacon, their intention was not to do things. Their intention was to understand the deep uh, structure of reality. And as a side effect of their effort, we've been able to do things. But precisely because we understood more than we were able to do before the structure of reality. And of course we may say that the point of technology is to take advantage of science and to do things. But that's not completely the, the point of science. Science, for example, is busy with uh, the Big Bang. I don't think that we are anywhere near to make another universe. So we, don't, we are not interested about Big Bang to do things. But because understanding Big Bang and other fundamental problems will allow to get a deeper understanding of what we are. I, I just wanted to add to, to, to your question that Sometimes science is victim of his success, its success. So it keeps to repeat the application of uh, models and methods that have been successful in uh, the previous period in which they apply them. And I believe that in this case, uh, a classic example is provided by neurophysiology, which is uh, the uh, offshoot of physiology that started basically in the 15th century. And they, their approach was to look inside bodies. And because that had been successful for movement, for muscles, for strength, for circulation, for metabolism, and for many other biological features, we keep applying that method. But we may be lazy. So, to, 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 to conclude, one of the biggest uh, uh, advantages of a theory of consciousness might be just what happened with quantum mechanics. It might be that in order to understand consciousness, we need to be pushed outside of our uh, comfort zone. So right now, science in, and many other disciplines are still inside a kind of epistemic comfort zone. They apply methods that have been established many, many years ago, and they keep applying them in the hope that this method that have been successful in the past will be successful in the future. But repetitive failure in the case of consciousness may compel the scientific community to move forward and to do what, for example, had been done with quantum mechanics or with general relativity with speed of light. They had to throw away the whole uh, uh, Newtonian uh, uh, framework. We have one question back here. Yeah. Yes, so I wanna bring up the issue of language and I'm curious how, your, how you found language being a limitating a limitation in communication of your findings around consciousness? And do you think that language is going to need to change in order to achieve a, a unified theory of consciousness, for example? I mean, we rely on a lot of translation. We are trying to now communicate ideas on a global level using the English language, at least in, in the Western world. Um, then there's all these new technology languages, and um, yet and technology has been developed in very limited, um, narrow frameworks. Uh, it's not like somebody can come and create a new Microsoft with a new framework for, an, I mean, maybe they could, but the competition would be crazy. So I guess on both sides, I'm interested in the technolo technology side, but also in um, um, semantics and, and cross-cultural communication of theory and as language up to the job. Is our English language today up to the job for communicating this theory? I, I would say so far the answer is no. Okay. And that, in fact, I, I've been working with some colleagues on a, on a history of 
of artificial intelligence. And uh, one of the things that we've looked at is arguments about consciousness. And they're almost all definition wars. So you have people on two sides of a, of, of a table saying, this is consciousness. No, this is consciousness. <laughs> and they're talking about completely different things. And of course, no progress whatsoever gets made in that situation. Uh, people scream a lot louder, but, but there's no understanding because uh, there's no common semantics. And, and so I think, I, I think you point to a very, very large issue uh, within not just the general community, but within the scientific community particularly, uh, you'll find different theories of consciousness that are actually a little bit of window dressing on different definitions of consciousness. And as long as the definitions are incompatible, one can't compare the theories meaningfully. But I'll, I'll let other people also speak to this issue. Uh, just I to think be it's a key issue. Just to be provocative, I, I think by the time we have a good working theory of consciousness, we'll actually be able to just download that concept from me to you, and you'll get it. I don't even have to speak it. So, so I, I mean, wow. this sounds like a theory, but you know, there's good research where we can implant memories in, in r rats and mice. Washington University and, T and Weissman have sort of communication, trans uh, re reception and transception. That's an early phase, right? We're at the sort of dot matrix printer side of this thing. It's very pixelated, but it's going to keep improving. So who's to say we're going to need that language later? Um, so uh, Noam Chomsky moved to Arizona about three years ago, famous linguist. And I've, I've gotten to know him a little bit. He's spoken at our consciousness conference. And I picked up a, a couple of his ideas that are controversial, including that uh, uh, grammar, there's a universal grammar that uh, regardless of the particular language, uh, there's some kind of structure in the brain that manifests, for example, hierarchy in, 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 in sentences. Sentence, uh, phrase, word, syllable, phoneme, the meaning, this hierarchical tree-like structure. And they've looked for it in the brain uh, in terms of neural networks uh, uh, for years and haven't found it. And I. I know this sounds like a broken record, but I suggested to Chomsky that it might be in the microtubules and uh, his X-bar structures, his branching patterns. And he hasn't uh, uh, agreed with it yet, but he's thinking about it. So the point is that I think language may actually be, be very uh, basic in terms of cognition and the, how consciousness is organized uh, in, in biology, even, even in animal, even in animals that don't speak, uh, that aren't verbal, that there's some kind of organization of logic and cognition at a very basic level, below the level of cells, I would say, that manifests uh, cognition and, and language, and that at some point leads to consciousness. Um, I'd just like to say, to address the question, that language evolved to, to deal with the everyday world. And when you do, you do with the everyday world, a bit like Chris was saying, everyone agrees what you're talking about. You point to a chair, everyone looks at the chair, they can see where the chair is. And in the everyday world, you can prove things. It's, you can say, I have a hypothesis that that cushion is on the, on the chair. And everyone can look, it's on there, and you can really prove it. And then if you put the cushion on the chair, everyone will agree and say, that is proof, yes, the cushion is on the chair, because we all agree. But when it comes to things like consciousness, even if you can get definitions, it's very hard with the uh, subjective and abstract things to reach some kind of, that's not really what language was, was about. And when you get to the final ultimate truth, then the reason you, you can't capture what the ultimate truth in language is, you can't say what it is, to, to say what something is, is always defining it in terms of something else. So if you try and define the ultimate reality that encompasses everything, it's not in terms of anything else, it it's, gives rise to everything else. And so for me, to reach, to reach really these kind of levels, language has only a heuristic function. We come up with kind of theories and ideas about how things are, and we hope that they will provoke in us some kind of jump, lump, jump forward in intuition so that we get closer to the real experience of reality, which, which experiencing it is the only way that you actually get, get to it. Yeah, well, to a large extent, language has been the culprit, I think. Um, as regards consciousness. Because when we say things like, I am uh, here, we use words that maybe they're just a linguistic invention. 
When I say you are there, what would, who has ever seen an I? Who has ever seen a we? These are linguistic entities that exist only in the language, in the way in which we describe what's going on. They're not part of the physical world. They have been introduced in our conceptual framework of reality by the structure of the language. We introduced the subject, <coughs> object, predicate structure, and we, do that, we took that structure so seriously that we've been looking for those entities in the real world. They, they have been introducing the language, and because language speaks about many things which are real, apples, boxes, uh, pebbles, we thought that those entities, I, here, now, we, were real too. And we've been looking for them as though they were real things in the world. But it may be just a linguistic illusion to a large extent. That's not completely a linguistic illusion, but it might be that in the case of language, we will need to uh, revisit and, uh, our linguistic uh, structures to get closer to the structure of reality. I mean, in quantum mechanics, we have exactly the same problem. The traditional linguistic structure don't work well to describe what's happening. Hi. Well, I would like to bring you back to stories um, I was really wondering, um, besides your very personal, um, your very pr professional development or just the aesthetic value of the pursuit or some intrinsic eroticism about microtubules, um, what has musing about the theory of consciousness done to your very personal lives? I can answer it if you want. Yeah. Okay, so um, I used to be a materialist scientist um, for the first nearly 30 years of my life, and I thought religion was bullshit, and it was I, all crap, and, uh, and then something happened to me, like a flash, and I realized that it's not true, and then I started reading about all this stuff, and that was 20 years ago, and, uh, and um, I had a hard life, you know, everyone has a hard life, like, I had a lot of problems, and in the last 20 years, my life has completely transformed. And I just can't express, and for sure not in the one minute I have now, I can't express how much my life has been transformed and uh, how much better everything is for me and people around me since I understood what, uh, to me, is a much clearer idea of what's actually going on. So for me, the answer is completely transform my life. I got, I, got it. Um, I got interested in consciousness when I was an undergrad and uh, I took a philosophy of mind class. I was a pre-med, science, physics, math, uh, chemistry major. And uh, the philosophy of mind class really interested me. Uh, not enough to not go to medical school, but when I was in medical school, I was oriented toward neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, because they were the brain mind subjects, but not the, none of their, those lifestyles grabbed me. And I, I, but I did do a research uh, elective in a cancer lab and studied mitosis, cell division, and got obsessed with the microtubules, how they knew what to do and where to go. And it seemed to me they had some kind of intelligence, if not consciousness, at the subcellular level, which to me was, was a big mystery. I was also reading weird, you know, psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain and all kinds of weird stuff like that, which opened my mind. So, uh, and, and then when I went in, I, I stumbled into anesthesia because the guy who would become my chairman said, if you want to figure out consciousness, figure out how anesthesia works. And 40 years later, I think we have. Yeah, but I'm interested in your day-to-day -day operations, how this is, uh, this is the metacognitive value of the, of, of, of the pursuit. But I want to know the, 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 the practicalities, the pragmatic, uh, effect of this specific, such a, such a demanding, expensive, and uh, over, overarching uh, inquiry into, into the nature of reality, what specific tools actionable have actually been infused in your day-to-day -day life? I've met a lot of interesting people. I've been all around the world, been to <laughs> hundreds if not thousands of meetings including this one, and, uh, you know, it's been my academic career. I, I, 
Uh, I think I have an advantage in that because I, I earn my living as an anesthesiologist. Despite having an academic career, I don't need to get grants and please somebody and, and give them the answer they want in advance so that they'll give me money. I just call it, follow my nose and get funding. And uh, because of that, you know, I've, all, I've been kind of an outsider and iconoclast, and that's fine. It suits me because I've, it's allowed me to follow my nose and be what I consider to be uh, academically and scientifically uh, truthful without uh, sucking up to anybody. And uh, it's put me in a weird place, but I've enjoyed my life. I have a wonderful life, and uh, here I am. I, I would say that studying consciousness um, is a way of seeing how everything else fits together. And um, in, in my particular case, I had a career involved in physics, computing, molecular biology, uh, developmental biology, uh, philosophy, and it's working on questions having to do with consciousness, which I came at from a physics point of view initially, uh, defining consciousness in terms of observation. But trying to address that question uh, opens up the connections between what are generally thought of as completely different disciplines. And I would echo your own earlier statement uh, that uh, these disciplinary boundaries need to be dissolved actively and I think that working on consciousness is, a, is actually a tool for doing that. In the movie, A Single Man, the main character, at a certain point, says, are we really a, a neural activity sealed inside a brain in a pitch dark place? And we, do we really see the world through shadows? And, uh, and then he says that if that were true, it would be very creepy and spooky. We would be separate forever from reality. And uh, I, I remember that uh, ever since I was a student, I was obsessed by this problem. How is it possible that if I'm a brain, I can see you, I can see the, the, the other people? How can I get out of this cage, which is my body? Because it seems that I should be imprisoned into the, the body. And uh, uh, I remember that I, I was working in AI and robotics. And one day um, uh, we had a couple of hours and we had free time. So I took a walk on a place not different from Titignano with a beautiful landscape close to Parma. And there was a valley. I got on top of a hill and there was a valley. And they could see everything on the other side of the valley. So it was just like the perfect metaphor for being separate from the world. There was a valley between the two of us, an empty space. And then all of a sudden I felt that I was on the other side of the valley. I was not where my body was, but it was the thing that I was aware of, on the, no matter how much space there was, because there was no real separation between myself and the world. And uh, it took to me 20 years to translate that feeling into an intellectual uh, solution into a scientific framework that I, I, I might be right or wrong, but at least at this, it has been translated in a conceptual structure. And for me, consciousness is one way to get outside of the cage of uh, the separation between us and the world. And like if I can use an expression which I don't know how, how much makes sense in English, I would say it's one way to have an intercourse with the world as a whole. I think we are probably at our time to wrap up. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for participating. Um, and uh, we will see you at the next session. <laughs>